Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining my presentation about unfolding distribution using quantum annealing. I'm giving this talk on behalf of two other colleagues, one of them sadly passed away last year. The work is based on a paper that we published on Journal of High Energy Physics and the computer code that we use to obtain the results. It's also public on our GitHub repository, so feel free to take a look or a fork it. So to begin with, let's define what unfolding is. So unfolding, or it's also known as an inverse problem or the convolution, is a procedure to correct for distortions that are due to uh, limited resolution of a measuring device. As a matter of fact, uh, this problem is not unique to um, experimental physics and not even just to science, but uh, every time you have a signal that is being transmitted by a, by a medium and the medium up, mm, apply some distortions, they basically have a situation where you would like to correct for, this, uh, for these distortions. Uh, so specifically in our case, the goal is to compare results between experiments and make the results more uh, human friendly. So for example, if you want to present uh, the picture of a distant star, you may want to apply some deblurring and unfolding substantially at the blurring or the noising uh, um, algorithm. Uh, so what happens is that um, you have some physical quantity that you want to measure and uh, uh, each interaction that is observed is uh, um, encoded uh, as an entry of a histogram. So a histogram uh, has a certain number of bins and uh, usually there is a range that goes, for example, from zero to some large number um, and so uh, what happens is that you can have situations where uh, the histogram representing the measurement um, can have, for example, a number of bins that is different from uh, the distribution that can be obtained from a calculation or a simulation. So simply taking the ratio bin by bin between uh, the measurement and the true distribution uh, might not work all the time. Also, uh, there are sources of distortions that are kind of hard to account in this case. So uh, sometimes there are processes that uh, look like the signal that you're looking for, but they're not. So there are background noises. Uh, uh, the value of a certain observable, so physical quantity that you want to measure is different between uh, the ground truth that comes from the actual interaction between particles and what is measured after the effect of the experimental apparatus. Uh, you can also have some false positives and some false negatives. So those are entries that are mistakenly discarded or taken into account. So to do all of this, usually scientists have a computer model of the experimental apparatus that, uh, for example, can be programmed in C++ or Fortran for performance reasons. And uh, you use this big program uh, to, uh, to encode the effect of these distortions. And uh, the idea is that you promote these efficiency factors to a matrix, and you call it a response matrix or migration matrix. And so all you have to do is basically to calculate the inverse of this matrix and apply to the actual data. And at this point, you have a ground level histogram that you can compare to the truth level or whatever comes from, uh, from a calculation. Um, so this is called the matrix inversion. And this is uh, basically equivalent to a least square fitting. However, this matrix inversion has some limitations. Um, so when you add uncertainties to, uh, to the measurement uh, and you do this inversion, you can have some situations where some sharp peaks can be introduced uh, or the simulation uh, perhaps uh, is not very well known. And so you can have additional noise on top of uh, already known effects. Uh, also, uh, you have to consider that uh, um, the migrations can have an impact. So for example, a well-behaved matrix is mostly diagonal, but uh, if, for example, you have situations where a particle with large momentum is actually measured with a low momentum or vice versa, this contributes to off-diagonal elements. But since those occurrences are very low, maybe they are not very well known, so they have a large uncertainty. And when you do the inverse 
then you have additional noise. So one possible solution is basically to add a regularization term that, uh, for example, can be uh, the absolute value of the second derivative of the, of the solution. So this is called the Tikhon of regularizations. There are also other methods, but this is the uh, most basic one and uh, favorite substantially. Um, so in order to do that, you need to recast the problem into a likelihood or a cost function based problem. And then you can optimize this function. So you understand where this is going. Uh, so the likelihood based method unfolding uh, has no actual matrix inversion. Uh, the idea is that the truth histogram is basically found by the optimization. So you have this likelihood function, you want to find the maximum or minimum of this function, depending on how the problem is set up. Um, so you have a constraint that uh, is added to uh, promote solutions that are smoother. So this means that you're reducing the variance of the solution, but at the price of adding some bias. Uh, also, uh, this approach allows you to account for uh, what are called systematic errors, which basically means that you are uh, systematically adding or removing some components. So, uh, so your truth values is always shifted, for example, to the left or to the right. Um, in a real life situation, the number of these systematic uncertainties can be as large as 100 or even more in typical um, experiments at uh, CERN uh, Large Hadron Collider. And so all in all, mm, this kind of calculation is like the state of the art, but it also takes a long time. It can be up to two days to find a solution. And so the idea is that perhaps a quantum annealer can help us to speed up the calculation. But unfortunately, um, at the moment, uh, this method can't really uh, handle the full-fledged formula that has some exponential, factorial, so some simplifications are needed. But worry not, because those are not really strong assumptions. So for example, um, most of the times, the number of entries per bean is pretty large. So the Poisson distribution that represents a counting experiment per bean can actually be promoted to a Gaussian. And if you take the logarithm of this function, you basically have a quadratic function that is uh, much easier um, to handle uh, in the realm of quantum annealing. Also, um, you generally deal with floating point numbers, but then you can digitize these numbers by expanding them um, in a binary format. And so you need a binary format because the solution has to be found as a function of a string of qubits. And so in the end, you will have uh, a solution that is basically encoded by a number of qubits that is the number of bits that you use uh, to encode each bin times the number of bins. So let's take a look at uh, um, the anatomy of this function. Uh, so to begin with, you have this x vector that is substantially <clears throat> The, uh, the binary expansion uh, of the value of each pin. So this appears in two places. One is um, multiplied by uh, the response matrix, and the other is uh, uh, the one that accounts for, uh, for the smoothness of the solution. Uh, the response matrix, in this case, is a square matrix, as we've seen before, and uh, basically multiplies a, a binary number to get a decimal number, and uh, this product, r time x uh, has to be compared to the, uh, to the vector of, um, of real data. And you want to minimize uh, this distance, so the, the difference uh, between these two numbers. And, uh, and finally, um, the smoothness is given by uh, the square of the second derivative uh, of, the, um, of the solution. So, so this is basically done by multiplying the x vector by the Laplacian operator that is uh, a representation of the um, discrete second derivative. Uh, now, all of this has to be encoded somehow in a cube of weights. This is a kind of long calculation that we have done first by hand, and then um, we encourage you to, uh, to use a package called Einstein sum, this part of NumPy, and also um, you can probably more easily get the result if you use a software package called PyCubo. So I'm not showing here the result, but uh, uh, it basically follows quite naturally from the definition of this quadratic equation. Um, 
the problem also has uh, a parameter that we call lambda in this case. It basically controls the relative importance of the, uh, of the smoothness of the solution uh, compared to the uh, unregularized uh, uh, solution given by the first term. Um, so unfortunately, we couldn't really use uh, actual data because they are not public and the experiments do not release all their uh, software to carry out the simulation that in any case would be extremely massive. Um, so we created two, two toy models, as we call them, that capture the essence of a typical measurement that is carried out at the CERN LFC. So these two scenarios correspond to um, the measurement of the invariant mass of a particle decaying into two other particles. So basically you have a spectrum that is kind of Gaussian-like. And the other one is a steeply falling distribution uh, that is, uh, for example, um, a representation of the momentum distribution of particles that are produced by interactions. Also, uh, we wanted to compare our results to a benchmark. And in this case, we decided to use the uh, iterative Bayesian unfolding developed by Giulio D'Agostini, that is a well-known method. Uh, uh, we had to introduce some simplifications. So for example, um, the distortions are supposed to be well-known, so completely known, while in real life they are always associated with some uncertainties. Uh, and uh, our test is substantially a so-called closure test. So we know the truth level of both what we use to train the system and of what we use as pseudo data that are being unfolded. And the idea is that uh, the unfolded data have to match exactly uh, the truth level that we created. So it's not coming from nature, uh, something that we created uh, from the computer simulation. And so the uncertainty is associated with, uh, with the results um, are uh, equivalent to a one standard deviation calculated from 20 executions uh, of, the, of the experiment. And uh, each execution has 5,000 beads from the QPU. So let's look at the result. Uh, so it's kind of crowded plot, but um, the idea is that you have this uh, black dashed line that is the truth. And the results uh, are represented by the dots, and they have to uh, be compatible uh, with the black line. Uh, so the red is the benchmark, the Agostini unfolding, and all the other ones come from uh, our calculation based on a uh, cubo. Uh, so, in the, so in the simple case where you have this sort of Gaussian-like distribution, uh, basically all the solutions agree relatively well uh, with the ground truth. And uh, this is quite reassuring because it's a, it's a simple case. Uh, it's probably more interesting to look at the uh, steeply falling spectrum uh, because this shows the effect of the regularization. Now, this is known also from classical calculations that uh, if you're promoting smoother solutions for um, a spectrum that is not smooth at all, uh, they're not supposed to match the result. And in fact, they don't. So the only solutions that match the result are basically the Agostini folding that has no inherent smoothing parameter, uh, and then the Cubo solutions with lambda set to zero. If you set lambda to a number that is not zero, then you have uh, some difference, especially in the first two bins. So this is a kind of sanity check because it was not expected to, uh, to find the correct solution, and in fact, it doesn't. Uh, then another test that we carried out was uh, whether by increasing the number of bits or qubits that encode each number, uh, if we can actually get better results. And the idea is that if you have an increased granularity, uh, the solutions that are represented by individual dots should cluster closer uh, to the black dashed line. And this is basically what we observe um, now, I want to point out that the, there is a drawback. Unfortunately, what happens is that if you have more qubits, um, then usually you have longer chains of qubits, and so you basically have more noise in the solution. Uh, so in this case, we see that uh, if we use eight bits per qubit and we have five bins, then we can have chains that are as long as 15 qubits. So we actually tested two different uh, QPUs. One is the regular noise and one is the lower noise. But as a matter of fact, uh, they seem to be uh, quite consistent with each other. So we didn't really observe any striking effect. 
which again is pretty reassuring. Then let's take a look at the systematic uncertainty. So as I mentioned before, systematic uncertainty is uh, basically um, a piece that you always add to, uh, to your solution that is always pushing towards uh, to the left or to the right, for example. Um, so this can be substantially uh, represented by uh, some parameters, we call them S sub I for each bin, and those are estimated from the simulation. And then if you know what is a plus one or minus one uh, sigma variation, so one, in terms of standard deviations, then, uh, then you can do an interpolation and, um, and then uh, extract the most probable value from the optimization. Uh, so in order to do that, we promoted the uh, response matrix to a rectangular matrix that includes uh, the effect of the systematics. And um, this appears as a, a third additional term that is um, this x uh, times s squared. And uh, it comes also with a parameter gamma that controls the relative strength of the uh, importance of the systematic shift. Uh, so we tested a, a simple case where, uh, again, we have the peaking spectrum with just one systematic. And um, what we observe is uh, quite interesting. So to begin with, um, it is possible to recover, uh, to recover the solution. Um, interestingly enough, uh, if we set the value of this gamma parameter to a very large number, um, the solution diverges. So you don't really uh, find anymore the, uh, the value of the systematic. Now, it's not completely clear why this is the case, but uh, our understanding is that there is a large gap between the largest and the smaller uh, cubo weights, and so the, the granularity of the solution um, is not enough to uh, find uh, convergence towards um, a stable minimum. Uh, we also tested uh, um, a uh, hybrid approach based on a taboo search, and the results are basically equivalent between uh, the equivalent uh, the, the execution of CPU. And, uh, and the hybrid execution, although it was not easy to disentangle um, the part of the, uh, the optimization that is performed on a QPU and the part that is uh, performed on the, on the CPU. So to wrap up, um, unfolding or convolution or inverse problem is central to experimental sciences, but uh, it's um, ubiquitous in other areas as well. So if you have sound denoising or image sharpening, it's substantially uh, unfolding. Uh, we presented an implementation of a likelihood based unfolding uh, that has a regularization included. So this is substantially a state of the art algorithm. Uh, the cost function that we use to, to minimize is uh, derived from the full-fledged full one, but uh, it comes with some approximations that are not too crude. In any case, the math follows naturally uh, to define the cubo weights. The performance uh, is uh, comparable to the classical methods, but uh, the application only involves simple met models. And by simple, I mean there are a few bins, there are well-behaving migrations, and in the end, you have a short qubits chain. So uh, when in the future we want to scale up uh, the method to uh, real life situations where we have more than 10 bins, or maybe 100 systematics, uh, the more likely approach would be to use a hybrid calculation uh, or perhaps uh, in the longer future, uh, more powerful uh, QPUs will be able to handle this, uh, this solution. Um, so um, feel free to, uh, to download our, um, our code to try out the, uh, the algorithm. And of course, uh, you can read the paper on, uh, published in the Journal of High Energy Physics. Thank you for listening.